guys make somebody feel welcome. Excellent. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Is it, is it possible for me to get that through the monitor? Here we go. Excellent. Thanks, guys. All right. So you're still awake, still alive. So listen, I love that energy. Shh. But I want you to control a little bit. Put it into your heart. Put it in your mind. And listen, I just want to start with a quick little prayer, okay? Like, I need this prayer big time. There are two talks I've been battling with. It was the men's talk that, man, I was wrestling with the devil over that. And this one. So I need your help to pray for me that I do a good job for you, okay? So I really need you to pray, not just say the words. But we always ask the Blessed Mother, okay, to help us out. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I'm going to let you guys pray it. Hail Mary. Amen. Thank you. Um, you know what? I just want to talk to you from my heart just for a second and tell you that I have loved being here because you guys get all fired up, but you have this awesome ability I've seen to be able to come around and listen to a talk. And it's just a cool maturity level that I've seen happen, especially at my guys' session. Those, you guys were just I love you guys. You were just so amazing. Um, you guys stepped up beautifully. You stepped up beautifully. So, I need a bunch of Davids in this room right now, okay? You know what I'm talking about. So here we go. All right. <clears throat> this is a tough talk for me because, um, well, I'm a father. And I just see how this is affecting everybody and how brutal it is. And I just hate that my girls and my son, they have to go through all this. Um, you know, by the way, thank you for a great, key, uh, a great workshop just before this. And um, everything about the internet, it was just so enlightening to me and wonderful. And, you know... I'm just going to try to get so real with you guys and talk about this topic. And topic, I, I've been praying to God. I'm like, how do I talk about, how do I intro this topic? I'm going to talk about pornography. And I was like saying, God, how do I talk about this? And I, I remember one person was like, why don't you do a song? I'm like, what? <laughs> intro with a song. <laughs> I don't even know how you'd start that. Well, you got to pee for pornography in a ope. I'm like, I can't be singing a song, but make it seem like it's, cartoonish. So I figured I'd just say, hey guys, I'm going to talk to you about porn. Okay, we're adults. All right. So I want to give you a couple stats. I'm going to tell you a story, show you a video. So hang up, okay? Shh. Open your hearts, open your minds. Listen, do not just see me speaking up here, but, but listen, okay? These are kind of old stats, but, and I'm kind of old, so I need these. Listen, just, just try to get a handle on this just for a little bit, okay? You know, I just want to pray one more prayer. Just trust me. I just feel like we need this prayer. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast in hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father. Listen. In 2008, the company Hitwise cataloged 40,634 websites that distributed pornography. It's way more than that now. From 2001 to 2007, internet porn went from 1 billion a year to 3 billion a year. And one in five mobile searches are for pornography. You guys, when I was a kid, we didn't have that problem. I didn't have an internet. You guys now, you got to understand, it searches you out now. Before we had to go look for it ourselves, now it actually is designed to seek you out. It has a life of its own. This is a demonic thing, pornography. There is such evil behind this because it's destroying people's lives, marriages. I'm going to get into this. It is such a big thing. And, and for those of you who think, well, I don't struggle with that, listen, it's still affecting you in some way, shape, or form. Please just really listen. This is such an evil sin. And I'm going to share something personal with you. I'm going to tell you about the first time I ever looked at pornography or discovered it. I was in sixth grade. 
Listen, here's how it happened. It's a true story. See, back in our day, it was really hard to get because you guys just, you know, it's seeking you out. So click, boom, there it is. When I was a kid, you had to go like to the store and ask for a magazine, but the woman behind the counter was like your mom's best friend, so that wasn't cool. Like, hi, Mrs. Jones, can I have a pornography, please? You just didn't do that. That was really uncomfortable and weird because she was going to talk to your mom. But we had this kid in school who always got into trouble. His name's, I'll just say Steve. Steve all of a sudden showed me in sixth grade. He's walking by me in the hallway in school, and he goes, hey, I want to show you something. Open up his book, and he just showed me a little piece of it, and I was like, whoa, what's that? And he's like, it's called porn, dude. You got to try this. And I'm like, he, t- he talked to me like it was a potato chip. Dude, you got to try it, try this, man. And I'm like, great. So I was like, oh, I want to see this magazine. No, I'd never had anybody in my family ever talk to me about sex or anything, about what it is. Is it beautiful? Is it just for, hey, man, whatever. Is it just for fun? No clue. And I never thought I would see that. But there was something that really intrigued me. I'm like, I got to look at this. So in sixth grade, I made a deal. And I had to pay five bucks to my buddy Steve. Five bucks, which today is uh, about like $500,000. So five bucks, I had to go meet him. And the way I did this, I thought I was so clever. Clever. <laughs> I had an album cover with me. It had the song Sweet Home Alabama on it. And I... Uh, gave him the five bucks, and we're out there in the middle of the street, way down by him, and I put it inside the album cover. I'm like, nobody will know, but you got to understand something. My mom is like a Puritan. <laughs> she just knows if you're sinning. She's like, you're thinking bad thoughts. I'm like, how do you know this? She's like, I'm a Puritan. Now, <laughs> my mom was tough, great lady, but she could just tell, and she just made me nervous, right? And my dad was always like, just don't get arrested. <laughs> That was his advice to me on everything. Just don't get arrested. All right, Pop. So I got this album cover, and I'm like, oh, I got to get by my family. Because I really cared what my mom thought about me and my brothers. I just wanted to, you know, like, didn't want to ever seem like a punk to them or whatnot. So I've got the album cover. I remember walking up the drive, and I'm like, oh, I got to get this upstairs to my room without my mom reading my soul. I open the door. My dad's asleep in the chair watching TV. I'm like, perfect. Start going across, get to the kitchen where my mom reigned. She just knew everything, okay? But she was in the other room doing laundry. I'm like, yes. So I get to the stairs that lead up to my room. I'm like, I, almost to the point where I can look at some pornography. I've got my album cover, and I start walking up my stairs. But here's the deal with my stairs. There were four stairs that would creak when you stepped on them, and my mom knew which ones they were and who it was by their body weight causing the sound of the creak, how big it was. <laughs> So he'd be like, Sean, is that you? I'm like, how do you know that? She's like, I'm a Puritan. Now, I have no idea what that has to know about knowing body weights. But anyhow, I'll never forget how desperate I was to make it up. I'm like, okay, second step, Creek's got to make it to the third. Good. Okay. Banister. That creaks, but on this side it doesn't twirl over left. Good, 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 good. All this to look at porn. I'm like, okay. Great. Okay. There's books up here. I turn. I hit the books. They start falling. I reach down. I grab it. Have to switch it under my arm. Grab the hair. And I'm like, I'm, you guys don't know who this, but there was this guy named Indiana Jones, and I was just like him. But he was searching for something much holier than me in those movies. He's looking for the Holy Grail. And I'm like, I got porn. I get upstairs, and I'm like, oh, I made it. And I take out the magazine, I put it on my bed, and I'm just staring at it going, should I open this? I just know the minute I open, my mom's going to be like, Sean! I'm like, I know. So I was about to, and I was looking at it, and all of a sudden my mom goes, Sean! I'm like, what? And she goes, your friend just pulled up outside, and there was this girl I really liked, and Melissa's in the car, they want to take you to Riverside Park. That was a theme park about a half an hour from our house that I always wanted to go to. All my friends were in the car. She's like, Melissa. I'm like, are you serious? She goes, yeah. I was like, yeah. And I ran outside. I shut my door, ran outside, and right. All you guys are like, dude, don't forget the, oh. I'm three hours into the greatest theme park extravaganza ever, and I'm on this ride called the Salt and Pepper Shaker. I'm sitting next to Melissa, and what it does, it goes like this, and spins as you go down, 
And I'm like, this is fun. It was right then I remember I had left pornography right out on my pillow where my mom always comes to the room. And I'll, I don't know if you can do a close-up of my face, but I'm next to her and I'm going like this. I'm going, this is the... <laughs> and she's like, you look scared. I'm like, I am. I'm really afraid, man. I was so scared. My mom found out I'm a pervert. I know she's going to know. I still had like three more hours in the park and I couldn't do anything. We didn't have cell phones. I couldn't call my brother and go, dude, you got to come. It was nothing. It was just like, <gasps> and then Melissa's like, you're not that much fun. I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> they burn witches where I come from. <laughs> <clears throat> so they dropped me off and my driveway was this giant hill that led up to our house. It was the slowest walk ever. I was like, I get up to the door. I kid you not. I stood outside for almost two hours. I couldn't go in. But then it was getting dark and the monsters were coming. <laughs> and I opened the door. I'm like, oh, my dad's still asleep. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and I go. And my mom's not there. And I go up the stairs. <laughs> And I get to the door and I'm like, God, I need, please let this magazine be there undisturbed. Please let my life go back to normal. And I'm like, it's gone. It's gone. I just sat there and I'm like, oh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Right then I hear my mom go, Sean. I'm like, what? And she goes, time for dinner. What I heard her say is, you're a pervert. <laughs> So I go downstairs, and I set the table, and nobody's saying anything. Got my two brothers, my mom, dad, everybody's just having a nice dinner. I'm like, all right, when are you going to get me? Kill me now. Just kill me. And it was crazy. My dad's like, pass the corn. I thought he said pass the porn. Everything was messed up. <laughs> Everything was just twisted in my brain. <clears throat> <laughs> Two days, nobody said anything. So every day I'm just walking around going, <laughs> what, 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 what? It's horrible. Then all of a sudden I went down to my brother's, I won't say his name, went down to his room to steal some things. <laughs> it's just what we did as brothers, because I'd just go through his drawers and look for stuff and Oh, it's a, it's a knife, I'll take that. Like a pocket knife, not like, yeah. And I open up the top drawer and there it is. My brother took it. He didn't say anything and I'm like, oh, it's pretty scary, isn't it? When you think your mom took your pornography, let's see how you like it. So I steal it and I'm like, ha ha! <laughs> not a good idea. My brother freaked and just went to our mom and said, hey, that pornography you found, it's not mine, it's Sean, just so you know. He told her. <laughs> so I thought I was going to be dead. And all of a sudden the door opens a day later in my room. My dad goes, uh, I guess you're kind of curious, uh, read this. And he throws a book out on my bed about sex. He's like, good luck with that. I'm like, Thanks. That's all the training I received as a child. <laughs> Read this. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why you're clapping. It's really funny. This is going to look weird to the people viewing from home. Why are they cheering for the pornography talk? Yeah. But you know what? So many people are affected, struggling with it. So many people. So many people calling me, emailing me, struggling. And it's not just guys. It's girls too. And there's a video that I want to show you of who I think is one of the most courageous people I've ever seen in my life. So we're going to roll this short little video. Let your hearts be open. Hi there, my name is Cecilia War and I am a beloved daughter of God. 
Why do I start there? I start there because in our society, it's really easy to identify ourselves with the things that we like or the things that we dislike or the things that we struggle with. So for example, I could say, hi, I'm Cecilia War and I am a shopper. I love to shop. Or I'm a reader. I love to read. But really, that's not my inherent identity. My fundamental identity is as a child of God. And as a child of God, I struggled with pornography and masturbation for 10 long years. It started when I was nine years old and a friend of mine and I stumbled upon pornography um, when we were over at our house for a play date. We did not plan on this happening, um, but that day started a very shameful secret struggle. And neither one of us really had the vocabulary to deal with what we were experiencing. We didn't know the word pornography. We didn't know the word masturbation. Um, and so this really um, entrapped us and we didn't have the tools to break free. And I went to youth group um, some years later and once a year the boys got taken off for their version of the chastity talk and we, the women, got taken off to our version of the chastity talk. Um, and the guys would hear about pornography um, and the ways to break free if that was something they struggled with or just things to look out for. Um, and the women, we talk about relationships. And so as a young girl, I'm thinking, well, I'm not in a relationship with anyone. and. I'm the only girl in the world who's struggling with this, and I can't tell anyone. And so this really continued that shame and that secrecy um, until I was about 17 years old, and I took a leap of courage, and I didn't want to be entrapped by this anymore, and so I went to confession. Um, and I was expecting the priest to look at me when I said the word pornography and say, get out. You are not loved. You are not forgiven. And you are the only girl who's ever done this before. But instead, the priest looked at me with love and said, I am so proud of you. And I'm so sorry for what you've gone through. And Jesus loves you. And he forgives you. And you are made clean. And as he said those words of absolution, I was made clean. And I wish I could tell you that that was the last time I ever looked at pornography and I was healed that day. And it's just as easy as that. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the case. It continued to be a struggle. But there were some things that I did that really helped me in my fight for freedom. Um, so the first thing was I became a reconciliation-aholic. And I tried as hard as I could within 24 hours of falling to getting myself in front of a priest in confession. Um, and I found that when I went that quickly, it made it a lot harder to justify falling to the sin of pornography or masturbation again. The second thing that I did was I got myself in front of our Lord in the Eucharist as often as possible. So that was daily mass as often as I could make it. Um, and also getting in front of the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament in perpetual adoration. Um, that priest shared with me that when we are trying to free ourselves from a visual sin like pornography, uh, we have to retrain our eyes. We have to give ourselves good images. And so sitting in front of my Lord and having that be the image in my head um, really helped me to keep command of my thoughts and not just command of my actions. The other thing that I did is I started a day counter on my phone. Um, and so I would, every time I fell, I'd have to set it back to zero. Um, and after a while, it got really hard to set it back to zero when I'd been doing really well. Um, and so it became a, I'm not going to be, I don't have to do this forever, but I just have to make it one more day. I've made it two days. I can make it three. Okay. I've made it a week. I can make it two weeks. And pretty soon that day counter got so large that I didn't want to set it back to zero. Um, and so today it's been 1,465 days since the last time I confessed the sin of pornography. Um, the Victory app, which I didn't have when I was your age, um, has this feature built in. And so I strongly encourage the Victory app um, to help you on your road to freedom. And I just want to tell you, as your sister in Christ, that freedom is so possible, that you are a beloved child of God, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that he wants to make you clean, and he's going to help you do it. My name is Cecilia War, and I am a beloved child of God, and so are you. Amen. What a courageous young woman. What a warrior. I'll tell you what, 
She's being persecuted for that, and I know it. But her love for you and love of the Lord was just too important to her to not be able to share that with you. You know, that story I told you about me as a kid, it was kind of funny, but here's the thing. My, my parents asked me if it was mine. I lied. I blamed my brothers. I did all these things, and all of a sudden I be, started becoming this liar in my home, and my father didn't trust me anymore. My brothers and I argued all the time. It started wrecking my house back then and changing who I was. See, the sad thing is so many people are struggling with this, but nobody wants to admit it or talk about it because there's such shame with it, and that's how the devil works. He wants to shame you into staying into this little bubble world of thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, there's something wrong with me. I can't get out of this. I'm stuck. I can't ask for help. So our, people are going to think I'm so uh, distorted and twisted, and that's what the devil does. He's the accuser. He's the father of all lies. Pornography really affects us brutally. Pornography actually rewires our brain from the scientific aspect. It actually rewires our brain so that it actually can become an actual addiction. Let me read just this piece of science for you here. Science geeks, buckle up. Modern science allows us to understand that the underlying nature of an addiction to pornography is chemically nearly identical to heroin addiction. Dr. Jeffrey Satin over. And there also seems to be a correlation between pornography and violence. See, pornography and masturbation, they turn us in on ourselves and away from others. We objectify other people. We use them as something to be consumed. I believe the stats I heard before was people, when they're viewing pornography, will look for about one to two seconds, and then they're bored with that picture and need to look at something else. Like, so they condition their brain to be bored with somebody. And you have this beautiful wife going to this guy, and he's wondering why he can't even be intimate with her. And this is a very common theme in marriages. Guys are like, I can't even be with this beautiful woman because I've conditioned my brain to see women as dark, as dirty, as something to have. And I'm bored with her already. I'm bored. I need something else. I need something else. And it's really, when I say this, it's destroying marriages. Listen to me. I talked to the men's group earlier, and I said, Satan doesn't start destroying marriages once they're married. He starts destroying them now. So many people, when they become addicted to pornography, they can't even be intimate with another person or share their hearts with them. They live in this trapped world in front of a computer that's not even real. And what we have to realize is what's going on with somebody so that they're, they need this? What's lacking? What happened? What wound is going on in our heart? Because when somebody's viewing pornography and they're really getting addicted, it's because something else is going on in their lives. Something else is broken low self-esteem or a wound or so, something that happened when they're younger, doubt, whatever it might be, and, and they need that instant gratification to feel good about themselves, undesirable, I, I'm okay, I'm in charge, I'm in control. You see, uh, St. John Paul II said, pornography isn't evil because of what it shows, it's evil because of what it hides. I just want you to hear the difference. And I'm going to talk to you, because the maturity in the room is excellent, so I just want to share my heart with you about this. See, pornography says attack, consume, own. That person becomes your personal slave to do whatever you want with. And the thing that breaks my heart, too, is that, especially for the guys and for the girls, but I'm just talking to the guys, that girl was, was somebody's little girl once. It was a child. It was a little girl who used to go out in a swing set somewhere. And then usually she got abused. Her father wasn't there. And she got lost. And then people started saying, I can make money off you. I'm going to take you. You will now be my object. And sex trafficking happens. And we contribute to that when we view this. We help to keep these women enslaved 
and men enslaved by people who are using them and their bodies and the illnesses they get from these and the loss of possibly their soul so that we can have this gratification somewhere alone in a room and the whole thing's just so perverse and dark. As compared to this, the beauty of love and sexuality within marriage. Ready, just a real quick crash course, okay? Here's how beautiful it really is. When I got married to my wife, here's what went down, okay? I'm standing at the altar, and she starts walking down to me. If you met my wife, you'd believe in God instantly. She's just so magnificent. She starts walking down, and I'm like, wow. We're looking at each other, and we exchange our vows verbally. I say to her, I give myself to you totally and completely. I hold nothing back from me. Everything I am is yours, and I give myself to you. And she says back, I receive all that you are. I block nothing from you. All of who you are, every bit of who you are, I say yes to And I reflect that love right back to you. We've just exchanged our vows verbally. Later that night, honeymoon, we enter into the marital embrace. And now we're saying with our bodies what we said with our mouths. We're actually sharing our wedding vows with each other. It's this most beautiful, awesome, incredible, life-giving act. In fact, it's so beautiful that a human being can come from it. It's a life-giving act. Every time a husband and a wife make love, they're renewing their wedding vows. In fact, they're bestowing grace upon each other. They're elevating each other closer to God. And in fact, it's so life-giving that the bodily fluids from the man transferred to the woman help to fight cancer and depression. It's such a life-giving act. As compared to sitting in a room, looking at porn, you can see the difference. Something sacred and holy, the devil takes and twists and distorts. And we really have to battle against this. And we have some resources to do it, because you have to set up a game plan to be able to do it. I always say this, um, first things first, I've only known one person to be able to do this. Um, I just wish some of you guys had these relationships with your father and mother where you could just go to them and say, I'm struggling. I need help. I know one kid who did that and it was beautiful and his father's like, you bet. Let's get that computer out of your room. We're going to put it out here and I'm going to help protect you. And they help keep each other accountable. It's absolutely beautiful to be able to have a relationship to be able to go do that. I know for some of you are like, there's no way. Hey dad, I'm struggling with porn. What? I know, I know. But I talk to my son about it all the time. He has an app called Covenant Eyes on his computer, and I have it on mine. We take care of each other. It's just this, I'll tell you more about it, Covenant Eyes, it's great. If anybody types anything that's not kosher, you have an accountability partner who goes, hey buddy, what's going on here, are you struggling? So we look out for each other. It's kind of really cool. Hey, because I'm a human being, the devil can get me too. So I'm not taking any chances. If there's something that can help me, you bet I'm going to do it. But also setting up your house, being ready when you go back. I always say this, you're going to laugh, but do me a favor. If you are going to keep your computer in the room, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put a picture of Jesus right here crucified. I want you to drill it into the side of your computer right here. And on this side, I want you to put the Blessed Mother. And at the top, I want you to put an incredible huge picture of your grandmother right there. (laughs) One like this. But also, I want to show you one more quick video. I want to show you a little bit, it's real quick, just about the Victory app. You guys got to do this. People taking the time to help you um, engage with this. So if we can show that video real quick. One of the hardest parts about being a youth minister for me is when a teen or young adult comes to me and says, Mark, I really want to change this part of my life, but I don't know how. I want to break free from, from pornography, from sexual sin, from temptation, whatever, but I don't know how. What do I do next? And that's why a couple years ago, I got together with my good friend Matt Frad and our team at Life Teen, and we created something new called the Victory App. It's available on Android or iPhone. You can download it for free. 
And in the Victory app, you'll find readings and writings that will help you to go deeper in your prayer life, help you to overcome these temptations, to resist them. You're going to find daily trackers and, and, and elements that will help you see where you're most likely, when you're most likely to fall into this, to, to, to seek it out. So you can start to learn about yourself, what these triggers are, and help your soul lead your body instead of vice versa. There's even a built-in piece on the app where if your friend downloads it, also, again, for free, you can press one button and send a prayer request, a push notification right to your friend's phone. You know, I need help right now. I need prayer right now. That's what it'll say. Totally anonymous, but, but totally legit. This is the kind of accountability that you're going to need to move forward. The kind of friends and accountability you're going to need to finally be victorious in this battle. But that's not all. That we at Life Teen and the Youth Outreach Office at Franciscan University of Steubenville, we got together and we said, what else can we give all these young people this summer. And that's why we created a new website, leaveporn.com. And if you go there, you'll be able to find the Victory app, but you'll also find a ton of videos and blogs, things that will help you in your daily walk as you move forward from this conference weekend. We are with you, we are behind you, and we believe in you. You can be victorious in this battle. Do not give in. Strive for holiness. God bless you. Right on. Catechism. Pornography perverts the beauty and intimacy of the marital act for selfish pleasure. It injures the dignity of all, dignity of all those involved. You guys, pornography too, especially has a certain time when it's going to affect you and try to attack you. It's really important. Believe it or not, when you're hungry, when you're stressed, when you're fatigued, and when you're feeling lonely, that's when the devil loves to swoop in and get you. But here's the cool thing. Yeah, he might get you, but our God is an awesome God. He's powerful. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. God is for you. He's not against you. I was talking earlier to the young men, and I'm so worried that some of you begin to maybe believe these things because often a lot of people look at pornography and they fall into this despair of I'm a horrible person, I'm a horrible person. No, you're a child of God. You're not the accumulation of your sins. You're a child of God. And through Eucharist, prayer, confession, God is able. God is able. And I also want to throw this out to you. And this one's going to be a tough one for you guys. Fasting. Try one day a week just to have a small meal instead of like at dinner. Just say, you know what, I'm just going to have one sandwich. Practice denying yourself from things. Remember, I said this earlier too. You will never rise to the occasion. You will always fall to the level of your training. And if you have not conditioned your body and trained it to be able to say no to things, how can you ever do it when the moment comes and the battle happens? So we've got to learn to be able to do that. And now I want to share something from the heart <laughs> with you. And it always works better when there's music. Bro, could you play your guitar for me? Because whenever, I, just, I just made John a jam in the back room for me and play the guitar and sing for me because this man is just, it's heaven on earth to listen to this man sing and play the guitar. Um, <laughs> I, um, I took my family fine dining one day. We went to Applebee's and, <laughs> no, we do, we do, about once a month, fine dining. And I'm always looking for opportunities to show my girls. Oh man, I just, so much I just want to share with you. I am not a saint, but I'm a good father. I protect them, I fight for them so much. I've changed my life so many ways. I've moved somewhere because of God. I've battled for their souls for God because that's all that matters to me, that we're all in heaven together. That's all that matters. And if it means moving 3,000 miles, doing whatever it takes, I'm gonna do it because in the end when we die, I wanna be in heaven with my family and I don't wanna stand before God and have them say, did you lead your kids to me? Did you give it all you had? and have to look at him and say, no, I was kind of just really invested in myself. 
So I'm constantly, I'll never forget, when I explained the theology of the body, that little snippet I gave you about the beauty of marriage, because my daughter started, got that age and they were asking, and I started explaining the intimacy and the beauty, and they're both on the couch across from me, and my wife's on the side of this couch, and I'm here, and I started explaining that to them, it was so beautiful. They were so captivated because I, I, it was this. I gave everything I had in this presentation, the beauty of the intimacy of the marital act and how they came about because the love I have for my bride and how she receives that and gives that back brought them back. And they just kept leaning forward. After half an hour, they were both on my laps. They were so romanced by this in a very healthy way, I mean by that. They were just like, they just hugged me. And that night, they are like, Dad, will you sing for us? And they were just, they just wanted wow, this is something beautiful. So that when they see the distortion, they'll know. They'll say, that's not it. That's not it. So I often use moments that I can to help them grow. And I want to ask your permission to do something. I've had a lot of people coming up to me, and, and the topic of fatherhood has just been coming up. It was funny. I was going, maybe I should stop doing these talks. And it hit me. It's like, no, they need a father. You need a spiritual father, some of you. Maybe some of you don't have fatherhood in your life whatsoever, or you've had a bad example of it. And I'd like to ask your permission. You can reject it yourself, but can I spiritually father you right now? Will you let me speak to you as a father? Like, as your spiritual father. Will you give me that permission to do that? All right. Be, be careful what you just said yes to. Because some of you know me. I don't pull punches. I don't go anywhere to speak to get another gig. I go to speak so people can know Christ and the truth. And remember, Jesus did that, and it didn't turn out so well for him, but it turned out great for us. <laughs> you tell the truth, people will crucify you. And I just want to speak to you as a spiritual father. At Applebee's with my family, my daughters were sitting in the booth here across from me, and I was here. And I watched a woman come in, with um, short shorts, she was wearing shorts up to here. And she walked in and sat down and started eating. Right after her, another girl walked in, true story. She had this dress on and she was just dressed so nice and she, her head was just up and she was carrying some books and she just walked in with this like authority and this strength in her and it was just beautiful to see this dignity. Like she knew her honor. And then she went to eat. They sat at different tables and they started finishing up around the end and a group of guys came in and they were kind of just horsing around and like being kind of obnoxious and they were waiting to get a seat. And I went to my girls, I said, both of you, I want you to sit next to me on both sides. So they're sitting next to me, I go, I want you to watch this. And they're like, what? And I go, I want you to see these girls leave this building right now. And they're like, which one? I go, this girl right now. So the girl with the skirt up to here started walking by the door and all the guys were like, whoa, woo, you know, and they were just cat calling at her, all that stuff. And then she opened the door and she's like, whatever. And she walks out. And the girls are like, that was, the guy shouldn't talk to her like that. I'm like, watch. God just, I just knew it was going to happen. The next girl got up. And she started walking out, and they opened the door for her. You don't think pornography is affecting you? It is. The sex craze culture has us going on this slant away from God that we don't even notice that we're caught up into it. And I'm just going to say this with love and respect, and I understand maybe some of you don't get it yet, but if you're gonna truly be a follower of Christ, you have to be mindful of what you're watching because you're falling into the pornography culture. You have to walk, be careful what you're wearing because you're falling into the pornography culture. Keep the maturity level high, but if a girl was forced to come up here in her underwear on the stage, you'd be humiliated and horrified, but if we turned it into sand, you'd be okay with it. Because you'd just call it a bikini. All of a sudden, it's okay when we're in the sand. Well, it's fine now, and I'm going, it's not because you should be ashamed, it's because you're so magnificent and so beautiful. I gotta tell you, the most attractive thing to me is seeing my wife, and you don't understand how drop-dead beautiful this woman is. She's 
ridiculously gorgeous, but I love that she reserves that for me. She honors me and says, no, 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 this isn't for you guys. It's for my husband. It's beautiful. And she loves, and she loves in me that I don't treat her like a trophy, but as my sister, my bride. Because one day, I'll stand before God and he's going to say, did you lead my daughter home to me? I'm going to say, you bet I did. With everything I had, you bet I did. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the applause. But you can't. My sisters, actually my daughters, my spiritual daughters, you can't wear the shorts up to here with the butt cheeks hanging out. You can't. You cannot do that. I love you too much to let you do that. Why? You're objectifying yourself. Something's going on where you feel you need that because something's broken because you've forgotten who you are. And gentlemen, you need to not encourage that. Man, if only men would say, you know what? You don't need to dress like that to get my attention. I can see the glory of God in your face. If only men would stand up and be like that again. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody here. But the clapping's easy. But what are you going to do when all your friends are like this and you're like, you know what? I'm going right here. I know who I am. And listen, it's, again, it's not to shame you and because your body's, it's because it's so beautiful and so wonderful that it shouldn't just be thrown out as something like, look at me. It's like, no, you are sacred and fearfully and wonderfully made. In this section right here, the sacred, the holy part, the womb where the child is conceived and brings forth life. And for a while, you're like, God, you bring forth life. That's so sacred. And ladies, I'm going to be honest. As a guy, it's really difficult, especially for us. It's difficult for you too, but our anatomy is a little bit different and it's really difficult for guys. And what I'm saying is this, I gotta be careful. There's so much that you just got out of that. That's so wrong. (laughs) Help us. Some guy's kneeling down trying to go to adoration and your cheeks are hanging out. He goes, oh my Lord. <laughs> Lord, I need you. Oh. This sounds like I'm just picking on the girls. I'm spiritually fathering you. Gentlemen, fight. Be David, fight. Take on this Goliath we're talking about here. It's destroying marriages. It's ruining homes. It's killing. And there is a devil going, excellent. You girls keep doing this. The guys keep saying, yeah, this is great. And then we all go, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. He's like, you're full of it. You honor me with your lips, but your hearts are so far from me. Because I just witnessed a keynote where my brother said, will you give up your longest thread? And you were like, never! I'm like, have you forgotten who you are? If you want to say yes to Jesus, that means saying goodbye to other things. Do you really want Jesus? Are you willing to give up the things that could keep you hindering from him? And think about it. Jesus is like, I will raise you from the dead. I will give you peace. I will heal you. Just give those things up. I don't know, because this thread's really long. And that whole crossy thing, that's really cool. And then I get to cry when you come out, and that's really cool, too. But I'm really, look at it. This is really long. And, and people, look at it. People, and I'm like, oh, man. Have we forgotten who we are and why we're alive? My sisters, I believe so many men will become saints by the way you walk with your honor. And my brothers, I believe women will become saints by the way you look at some girls. When you look with eyes that say, I wanna elevate you to 
towards God and not to use you as pornography, even in my mind, but I want to lead you to God, it changes the heart of a woman. And I know this sounds really corny, and this somehow turned into a chastity talk too, but what I'm saying is, I know this will sound corny because I'm old, but girls will laugh at this right now, but deep down I think they think it's cool. If some guy said, you know what, I want to go out with you, but I don't want to have sex. I want to lead you to God. I want to be the guy who protects you always and lays his life down for you. (laughs) Girls, you're clapping, but then you show up on the date with your skirt up to here. Help us out. Don't you see the devil laughing at this? Both feeding on each other, and I'm saying, let's break it. Let's ask God tonight to remind us who we are and our dignity and elevate our minds to the reality that we're the sons and daughters of God. We are the sons and daughters of God. Fight for this. Last thing, because I've gone dreadfully over. I love you all, and I'm going to be your spiritual father for the rest of your life, whether you know it or not. I'm going to pray for you, but here's the deal. My job as a spiritual father is to go like this. I love you guys so much, and I'm going to fail you because I'm a sinner too. So as I hug you, I'm gonna turn you over to the perfect Father in heaven who will never leave you, fail you.